honey, don't drink any more of those. It's gonna keep you up all night. It's terrible for you. Don't you understand? It's alive. I've created a show, a creature. It's a jigsaw of my worst fears. I, I saw breasts with eyes, spirits and demons chasing me. But God is already dead. Maladapted Automaton. Hello, welcome to Maladapted Automaton. My name is Nathaniel. Um, the purpose of the show is to talk about uh, film adaptations um, uh, from a variety of different sources. Uh, anywhere from books, comic books, video games, uh, myth and legend to history, which is tonight's film. Um, you will also wonder, perhaps be wondering why I'm surrounded by candles and I am doing things by candlelight. Uh, the reason for that will be kind of apparent when I introduce tonight's film. Uh, the purpose of the show is to do that, uh, do the comparison and to talk a little bit about not only the film itself, uh, but also about the source material or the source event, as the case may be with Gothic. Uh, Gothic 1986's film, I guess I already let that cat out of the bag. You will have to bear with me. I'm a little nervous. This is my first time doing this. Um, normally I do a podcast. Um, and so normally I'm not in front of a camera. So this is a, a, an experiment for me. It's a little bit of a journey. Uh, so I hope you'll bear with me. It's also extremely hot in here. The, the candles may not have been a great idea. Um, it's getting very, very warm. And uh, so you'll have to forgive me if you see me kind of wiping sweat off my forehead. Uh, not only are the candles adding to the general heat, but it's also pretty much in the 90s here in Missouri. Um, very, very hot week. And uh, so, of course, I choose that week to, to have a bout of inspiration and surround myself with candles like I'm in a Sting video. Um, that's a reference to wrapped around your finger if, uh, if you're following me, you know. But, uh, but yeah, that's generally the idea behind the show. Um, the reason why I chose Gothic, like I said, I've already had the sort of the let the cat out of the bag on that one, is that... Um, First of all, uh, it's a favorite film of mine. Uh, I've always loved this film. I think I first saw it in high school when I was probably 15, 16. Uh, rented at the local video store. Was blown away by how, how weird a movie it really is. And it's a very weird movie. Um, the other reason is, well, it's about uh, creation. It's about creativity. It's about making something and being kind of frightened of that. And I, my anxiety towards this, I've been kind of toying with this idea for this show uh, since before I started my podcast. This was actually the first idea. And I got a little, uh, I was got gun shy. I was like, I don't feel comfortable in front of a camera. I still am not, uh, but I'm hoping as time moves on, I'll get there. Um, so basically, I just, I'm, I'm you know, hoping my raw charisma uh, carries me from here, from, <laughs> from now on uh, until I get more comfortable. Uh, the other reason is that this movie is actually, uh, it's pretty queer. And, uh, and right now it is uh, Pride Month. Um, and uh, even though Pride Month is not mine to celebrate, um, it, uh, as a mostly straight uh, cis white male, Pride's not exactly for me. Uh, it's for LGBTQ people. And, uh, and I don't like to use the word ally, but because I feel it's a little self-congratulatory, but I'm a supporter of LGBTQ people. And as the show goes on, we'll probably talk more about my past and my background, and that will become apparent as to why. So if that ticks you off, like, did he just say he supports LGBTQ? Maybe this isn't the show for you. Um, thanks for stopping by. Um, but so there's a little bit of that. And as we go in, talk a little bit about the history of the people this film is based on. Um, we'll see a lot of uh, queer theory going on in this film uh, and the people that 
uh, lived it. So obviously Gothic, directed by the great Ken Russell, um, uh, he has passed away, he's been dead, uh, dead for some time. Uh, he was uh, uh, probably best known for doing Tommy uh, overall, uh, best known for doing Tommy, the musical based on uh, the music of The Who. You know, Tommy, can you hear me? Uh, I can't sing any more of that or I'll probably get sued. Um, but anyway, the idea is it was that, that got him a lot of, of accolades. He did a lot of other films as well. Very, very prolific career. Uh, very controversial career as well. Uh, devout Catholic his whole life, um, right up until his death. He, uh, a lot of his films actually dealt with um, being very critical of Catholicism and religion, um, which puts him right along with uh, uh, the company of uh, the characters and the people they're based on from this movie. Um, Russell's also probably best known by, for genre fans for his very controversial The Devils uh, with Vanessa Redgrave, uh, which is so controversial it's actually still pretty much not available in its actual final form. It's only available in certain edits. And even then, it only pops up here and there. It was on Shutter, I think, last month or two months ago. Um, if you did happen to catch it, uh, if it comes up again, I highly recommend it. I'm sure someday I'll cover it on the show. It's, it's a really phenomenal film. Um, also, was like Oliver Reed in it. Uh, he also was probably best known for Altered States, starring William Hurt, which was about uh, sensory deprivation and schizophrenia and, um, and a lot of other weird things. Layer of the White Worm. Uh, all those films usually all utilized certain surrealistic imagery, uh, a lot of green screen work, uh, very, very strange stuff going on in all these movies. And Gothic is a weird movie too, but it's actually probably Russell's most straightforward film uh, in the sense that it doesn't actually get, it gets weird, but it doesn't get as weird as those other examples might. Um, you know, there's no green screen of a, of a main character in a Jesus pose with Romans attacking each other and rabbit, people with rabbit heads. It, it, that, that stuff happens in his other work. Um, in Gothic, he, usually, he mostly relies on atmosphere, uh, hence the candles. Uh, it's a very, very fire-lit movie, uh, opulent manners. He uses a lot of forced perspective, loves to have either characters being very, very tiny in the frame or being very, very straightforward and right up in front of the frame. Um, also, so he creates either these broad, broad palette landscapes of people, you know, being overwhelmed by space or claustrophobia over the clock where it's all closing in on them. Um, <coughs> it's a, uh, it also uses a lot of a very interesting cinematography, a uh, very, very weird score, a lot of one woman wailing uh, kind of stuff. It's a, it's a spooky movie. It sometimes it goes a little bit over the top. Um, everybody in this movie is giving 110%. Um, uh, particularly Julian Sands and Timothy Spall, who are both in the film, were the two MVPs. Um, and uh, for those of you who dig it, uh, you get to see Julian Sands naked in this movie. So, thumbs up. Um, but uh, uh, Julian Sands plays uh, Shelley, the, uh, the romantic poet. Timothy Spall is uh, Dr. John Polidori. Uh, it is, the entire film is basically a fictionalized account, but maybe not as fictionalized as you might think, of the famous summer in, uh, I think it was 1716, um, or 1816. 1816. Um, but yeah, it's, it's 1816. And uh, it's the uh, summer, uh, the year without a summer, 1816, uh, where, uh, Mary Godwin, then known as, would later be known as Mary Shelley, uh, came up with the F for Frankenstein. Um, the film more or less takes, a, where, so one of the things we want to talk about with this particular uh, episode is the concept of where fiction and reality intersect. And it's very important to Gothic's narrative. Um, a lot of Gothic's stuff, a lot of stuff that happens in Gothic is actually alluding to actual reality. Um, it has its critics uh, among historians uh, kind of saying, well, you know, maybe this wasn't what it was like. But then other people were like, no, it's probably exactly what it was like. So, uh, so a little bit of background on the reality of the situation. So Mary Godwin is the, is the daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollenstonecloft. 
uh, who were uh, both very revolutionary writers, philosophers, did a lot of writing on reform, uh, both political, religion, social, um, very, very radical thinkers. And um, Mary's mother dies shortly after giving birth to Mary, um, and Godwin gets remarried uh, to a woman named Claremont, who has a daughter, Claire, who becomes Mary's sort of best friend. The two of them become stepsisters, they also are very close. When Mary is 17, uh, Percy by Shelley, <clears throat> famous uh, romantic poet, and by romantic I, I, don't necessarily, I don't mean love poems, I mean dramatic poetry, uh, which is where of course romance comes from. You know, why would we have romance novels is because of the dramatic poetry, but there were love poems too. Uh, Shelley was a, was a romantic both in both sense of the word. Um, Shelley was a very radical figure. He was starting to gain a little bit of notoriety for his poetry at the time, but he was also very controversial. He was kind of a bad boy um, in this time. He was um, an atheist at a time where we weren't really atheist. He was a polygamist, uh, very much in, in line with free love. Um, I don't, I never found any actual reference to him actually being with uh, with another man, but he certainly did seem to to uh, be very much cool with it. I mean, I think that he actually, I, I read some, a li in my research, a little bit of the idea that Mary uh, may have had a, a homosexual relationship while being married to Shelley, and he had kind of encouraged that. Um, that's, again, it's all history. It's, you know, it, it's, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, right? <laughs> but the idea is, um, excuse me, uh, the idea is that he, uh, he's very much into free love and, and polygamy. He's married at the time, married and has two children. Um, he, he travels off to uh, William Godwin's house, Mary's father, uh, because he's very, very influenced by his work. Uh, Mary is 17 at the time. Shelley falls madly in love with Mary. Um, they actually, they exchange uh, uh, oaths of eternal love over Mary's mother's grave, which is a fun little little uh, piece of trivia there for you. And the two decide to take off together. Um, uh, and along for the ride is Claire Claremont, uh, Mary's stepsister and best friend. The, she goes off with them. They go traveling through Europe for a while, and then and while in London they run into uh, Lord Byron, probably best known as the uh, romantic poet of his time. Uh, and he's an even bigger deal and he's even more of a controversial figure. Uh, at the time they run into him uh, in London, he's going through a, a really, really big scandal at the time, which is alluded to in the film. Uh, he, uh, his wife is divorcing him, uh, the mother of his child. Uh, she's, she's kind of publicly calling him a crazy person. Um, and it's not clear if she started it or if someone else started it and she just sort of kind of ran with it. But the idea is that at the time Byron may have been having, um, almost certainly, probably was, having an affair with his half-sister, Augusta. Uh, and that Augusta had a child that may have in fact been Byron's. So all of this is going on in London. And at the time he meets, uh, he meets Shelley and they are like, they become pals because they're both kind of big name romantic poets. He likes Mary. Um, Claire kind of kind of stalks him and finally gets him to sort of have an affair with her. Um, it's a very, very complicated story. Uh, but they, but basically, I mean, Byron is almost pretty much very clear that he's, she's not gonna be a part of his life. He doesn't really want much to do with her, but he has sex with her because she's good looking uh, and has a great singing voice. Uh, and that's more or less all he wants to do. And so the scandal becomes so great that eventually he breaks things off with, with Claire and he takes off with Dr. John Polidori, his, uh, his private physician and biographer. And the two of them travel around uh, Europe again themselves for about a month before settling at Diodori uh, on Lake Geneva. Um, Claire, it's unclear whether or not Claire knew she was actually pregnant with Byron's child or if she figured it out a little bit later. But either way, it's her idea that basically she gets to go crash his house in Geneva. She finds out where he's staying. She, um, she then begs Shelley and Mary to go with her because she knows correctly Byron won't want to see her. Um, so they go to Geneva. And um, Byron, sure enough, Mary, uh, Claire is right. Byron doesn't want to see them. 
doesn't want to see her anyway. He's happy to see Shelley and Mary. Uh, the film does eventually does state that they, more or less it all happens in one night, kind of a spirits did it all in one night kind of thing. Um, in reality, it was a whole summer. And, uh, and in the film, Byron has them stay at his house. In real life, they just rented their own villa down the road. Um, partly the idea of the reason why Shelley and Mary were actually kind of up for it was because they were actually having scandals themselves because, again, Shelley was married. Uh, and he's with uh, Mary, uh, <laughs> a teenage girl that he's madly in love with. Um, <clears throat> he then, but they go and the idea is that they hang out for the summer. And Byron suggests they write ghost stories. Um, the whole time, Mary doesn't really have any ideas until she has a nightmare in August. Um, in real life, the, the film more or less suggests that it's just like there's a bad storm front going on in Geneva. In real life, it was actually, there was a, uh, a volcano that erupted in Indonesia that actually screwed up the uh, weather so badly that in Geneva, um, all over Europe, they were having uh, uh, incredibly inhospitable weather. Uh, it was, there was frost. Uh, freezing rain, all kinds of stuff. It was very cold. And so the idea is they were going to be in Geneva in summer there and hang out uh, and do stuff outside, have picnics and go camping. Uh, instead, they were pretty much stuck inside the whole time. And uh, Mary kind of drolly kind of suggests that <clears throat> the idea is that uh, she's an, I think her quote was something to the effect of, I was an avid listener, but not much of a participant, kind of suggesting that Byron. Uh, Shelley and Polidori were probably doing a whole lot of mansplaining um, about, you know, history, religion, politics. Um, and as I stated, uh, you know, it's uh, that Byron, uh, Byron is another character who is it was certainly not entirely straight. Um, Byron's history, by the way, is its whole other episode. I uh, highly recommend reading Byron's, uh, Byron's background. It's a really, really fascinating read. I had no idea until I was doing research this episode. The guy ended up becoming like a, a freedom fighter in Greece at the end of his life, um, it, it, to the point where he had a, um, a sugar baby. He had a, he had a, a page, a teenage, teenage boy, Greek boy as his page, and he was obsessed with him. He loved him, and he gave him all his money, and uh, the kid wanted nothing to do with him, just took his money. But at the same time, he's actually spending a ton of his, of his own fortune arming Greeks against the Turks at the time. Um, uh, he ends up dying of a cold, more or less, uh, in Greece. Um, but um, fascinating stuff. Um, then he was, of course, buried in London, despite his dying wishes being, don't send me back to London. Um, but Byron kind of earns that, as we'll get into. Um, a very, very uh, criticism that happens a lot with this film um, which has been, uh, is that, again, the idea is that they get together at this house and they start doing laudanum, which is, you know, and they, they're getting high and having hallucinations as a result and, and having kind of orgies and, and this sort of open sexuality. And there are certain critics who have said, like, that's not true. That's not who they were. Um, Julian Sands, uh, I think, quoted in an interview about the film, that he was like, well, no, that's exactly who they were. Uh, it would be Victorian whitewashing to assume that they weren't, because in reality, these are these are people. These are guys who were atheists. These are people who were atheists. They were into free love. They're into polygamy. They're into all kinds of things. Um, it's actually very, very likely that they spent their entire summer getting high uh, and talking about how God is dead while in between boning sessions. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, so, but the film basically says so. So at this point in reality, what like so, and like I said, there's some there's allusions to this, you know, like uh, um, Augusta is mentioned um, with uh, Byron bringing in Justine, his uh, his maid, making her put on the Roman mask of Augusta, uh, the Roman goddess of fortune, good fortune, um, and like weeping, <laughs> like it's it's a weird movie, okay. Um, and uh, like I said, then you have Timothy Spall's Dr. Polidori, who in the film is, is, is struggling to, to connect uh, his homosexual urges towards Byron, um, towards everybody, really. Um, in reality, the, the big controversy with Polidori was that he becomes, in real life, uh, allegedly becomes pretty obsessed with Mary. 
uh, during that summer, and Mary's trying to get him away from her. Uh, at the same time, uh, Claire is trying to get with Byron, and Byron wants nothing to do with her. Um, in the film, it's sort of like Shelley's horny for Mary, Polidori's horny for Byron, uh, so is Claire, uh, and then uh, Byron's horny for everybody. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting movie. Uh, but then the idea is that Byron, that, that Byron in real life, there's a very scene at the beginning of the film um, where Byron's very cruel to, to Claire. And again, in real life, he was not a fan. And that relationship would never get better. Um, but at the same time, he probably wasn't kicking her in the face or holding her <laughs> above a fire. But maybe he did, who knows. But the real life Byron was supposed to be uh, relatively passive. Um, uh, if not a little uh, very sexually active and maybe not super concerned with the feelings of the people he took to bed. Um, but the, the film sort of plays him as very devilish. Gabriel, Gabriel Byrne gives a very I am the devil performance, which why else would you cast Gabriel Byrne? Um, but the notion uh, of the film ultimately is that they uh, they're reading ghost stories, they're getting spooked, they're all high, they do a seance, um, Claire goes, has a seizure, uh, and then a, a monster, uh, a ghost, a spirit that they've collectively created begin to hunt them down, and it's based on all their insecurities. You know, Byron's uh, fear of sexual masculinity and his fear of uh, his, um, of, the con of, the, of his controversy, of his scandal. Uh, with Polidori's self-loathing, uh, his fear of leeches, uh, Byron, you know, they all collectively create something. Um, one of the things that the film does invent, and it's another, it leads to the second major criticism of the film, is that Mary had a miscarriage prior to this, prior to the event. This is an entirely fictional. Uh, she actually did have a, a premature birth. Um, that died uh, after a few days, rather tragically. However, when by the time they get to Geneva, Mary and Shelley, uh, they have a, an eight-month-old baby with them that whole summer. Um, they would have trouble. Uh, uh, they would have more kids, and uh, two of them would die rather young. Um, but the film makes Mary's entire kind of characterization very much about uh, she has lost a child. Um, she has... Uh, she's worried Shelley's going to leave her. Um, and so it does relegate Mary, who is a, a fairly feminist figure, uh, kind of relegated to, but what about men and babies? Um, and the film ultimately kind of, sort of, takes, takes the position that Frankenstein is sort of born of that. It's sort of how the film ends. Um, at the same time, it's those aspects that actually drive the narrative of the film which is that they've created this entity and Byron, Polidori, and Shelley all want to kill it. They're like, we have to destroy it. Um, and there's a little bit of what would end up being Frankenstein and, and sort of like an essay I've always wanted to write, which is the idea of um, if you take a woman out, if a man gives birth without a woman, then he's a god. Um, if a woman gives birth, she's a mother, but she's not a god. And there's even a line of, of, of Byron saying, you know, we are the gods now, you know, and they're, they're and talking about the idea of a, of a creator trying to destroy his creation or not caring about his creation. Uh, whereas Mary is sympathetic. She says uh, in the film, it did not ask to be born. And it's sort of that, also it's, it's implied in the film that Mary is actually pregnant at the time as well. She does not drink any of the laudanum which is what kind of keeps the movie in the realm of actual supernatural goings on. Otherwise, you might just assume they're all completely nuts. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the film, Mary uh, 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 undergoes a, a sort of a long, dark night of the soul uh, and manages to sort of put the creature back in the box and, uh, and without killing it. Uh, she, she sort of accepts it um, and gets over her, uh, her problems is sort of the implication. And that's what allows her to write Frankenstein. So you can make up your own mind and you wanna watch the film, which you absolutely should. Um, <clears throat> but the idea, what's fun about actually Mary's weird dream sequence at the end of the film is that's all, again, uh, allusions to what actually happened. 
Um, Shelly, she dreams of Shelly drowning. That happened. Shelly uh, later does drown in a boat accident. Um, rather young. Um, the, uh, there's a scene of Claire reaching through a, uh, a gate and Byron's holding the, a baby and is sort of unmoved by her plight. Uh, that happens as well. As I said, the relationship between Byron and Claire, Claremont never got really any better. Uh, Claire ultimately does uh, confront him with her pregnancy. Byron wants nothing to do with it. Um, Claire has the child later. She comes back. Uh, she manages to hunt Byron down again. I think by then he'd moved on uh, to Italy, I believe. She then tracks him there, hands him, and basically says, I want you to take the baby because with your wealth and, and influence, you can give the baby a better life. But she makes him swear that she will never, the child will never be, they have, it's a daughter, they have a daughter. The daughter will never be without one of their parents. Byron basically takes five minutes and then she sends the kid off to a, a convent, breaking that promise to Mary. Uh, Mary thinks sees her three times in five years. Uh, the kid dies at the age of five of, um, what did she die of? Anyway, she, she dies young, like five years old at the convent of illness, um, probably inheriting her father's rather sickly disposition. Byron was not, uh, <clears throat> not a healthy man most of his life. Um, Claire ends up hating him for the rest of, her, rest, of the, rest of their lives. And Byron reciprocates. He, he absolutely can't stand Claire. She's this thing that he can't get out of her life, out of his life. Um, by the end, they're cursing each other's names and it it's really gets nasty. Uh, Claire actually outlives everybody. She lives to 80. Um, and I think she has the happiest ending. Um, uh, the other thing that happens in, in Geneva in, in 1816 was also that uh, the, the ghost story competition actually does, uh, Byron created what's known as an excerpt, um, which is a vampire story. Polidori literally takes that story and then and, uh, turns it into another, into the vampire, um, which is talked about a little bit less, but it's usually uh, when people say, oh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and you know maybe in the footnote, there is also the vampire, or the vampire rather, uh, which starts up the whole vampire thing in, in Victorian England um, in the mid 1800s, uh, leading to Bram Stoker writing Dracula, which of course become a major, uh, major deal. Um, <laughs> what's interesting about that is because Byron did come up with the idea and wrote a little bit of it uh, in Geneva. Um, and Paul, I mean, basically, he doesn't care about it. He gives it off to uh, Polidori. Polidori then takes it um, and develops it, writes it. It ends up being published without Polidori's permission, it gets tossed out. Um, and it's published under Byron's name. Uh, and Bolidori is actually pretty pissed off about that, and so is Byron. Uh, apparently Byron was like, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, and uh, Polidori uh, eventually gets that cleared up, but to the point where there are still people who, if you ever mention the vampire, someone would be like, oh, Byron wrote that. You know, like, well, no, Polidori did. It was just based on an idea by Byron. Um, Polidori would ultimately have, uh, would, would allegedly uh, die of a drug overdose, uh, suppo possibly suicidal. He may have been trying to kill himself. He ended up having a very, very rough life um, with the gambling addiction and drug addiction. Um, his death was ultimately ruled natural causes, uh, with some historians believing the idea being that the doctor who did the autopsy um, was trying to do him a favor was like trying to keep his reputation intact. Um, and so that was, uh, that's how Polidori goes out. Um, but so all these things that Mary dreams of more or less happen. Um, you know, Claire does not have her, get to keep her baby. Uh, Shelley does drown rather tragically. Um, but, uh, but ultimately Mary goes on to write Frankenstein. Uh, and again, in real life, this was, it was just, uh, you know, a, an entire summer where they're kind of bound, locked up together. They read ghost stories and probably were engaged in some sort of hedonistic activity. Uh, if only because these people were into that. These were rock stars of their era. They were uh, very, very revolutionary thinkers um, and were influenced by revolutionary figures. Um, later on, by the way, Shelley and, and Mary would obviously get married after Shelley's wife dies later in that year, 
um, just a few months <coughs> after Mary had the, the dream that inspires Frankenstein, Shelley's first wife kicks, um, and Shelley and Mary would get married almost immediately thereafter. Um, and, uh, but, and, but Shelley never sees his kids again. He can't get custody of his children. Um, but the scandal around them does, uh, tend, does throw out. By the way, um, I don't want to be the guy who spoils this for you, but uh, you might have seen a meme that Mary Shelley had um, Shelley's mummified heart in her office. That's actually not really true. Um, Shelley's heart was taken by uh, someone, a collector, somebody who, who took it and wasn't supposed to have it. And um, they were kind of like touting that they had it. Mary eventually would buy it back, would eventually uh, get it from him. She either bought it or sued, I can't quite remember which. But anyway, she got the heart back, but she didn't really keep it. She, was, she wasn't that badass, but she did get the heart back and put it in his tomb. It's, uh, it's buried with him. Uh, in his in his tomb in some I think it's in London, um, but yeah, that's uh, that's sort of how this that whole thing turns out. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really fantastic film. It's very 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 strange, um, but not as strange as some of his others, featuring a lot of really great performances. A lot of really really nutty stuff goes on in that movie. Um, uh, to the, I don't even want to get into those. I mean, I'm already running up on time, uh, trying to keep this thing to the half hour mark. But, um, but thank you for indulging me. Uh, I'm going to get better at this and a little bit more focused with this. Um, but I do recommend watching Gothic. Uh, I recommend doing the reading on uh, on Byron, on Shelley, on Mary. All of them are fascinating history, um, and I've given you just the Cliff Notes version of that history. But uh, there's a lot of fun going on. Um, so tune in next week. We'll be doing something a little bit lighter. Um, we got some comic book movies coming up in the next couple of weeks because those are easy. Um, and I'm ridiculously lazy and terrified. Um, and hopefully that didn't come across too much. But I'm, I, uh, this was a pretty terrifying experience for me. So, uh, but I'm going to keep doing it. And um, this is my solo project. And this is what I'm going to try and do. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for sticking it out. Hopefully I didn't get too boring. Um, we'll be a little bit more focused next week and hopefully a little bit shorter. Um, but as I want to say at the end of every show is make sure you do the reading. Always do the reading. Um, if you're watching something and it, it, do some research. It's, it's, it's almost always worth your while. Um, and uh, remember that uh, if you, when you love, you are loved in return, and the rest is all confetti. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week. Good night.